Welcome to a podcast about wealth and life. We all know that our finances play a big part in how we live our lives. In this podcast, the advisors from Foster and Motley share insights and information about investment and financial planning topics and how they connect to your life. Research continues to prove that we are our own worst enemies when it comes to investing. Rather than a knee-jerk reaction to markets and their movements, patience and a plan can help de-stress your money experience. Foster and Motley's Rachel Rasmussen and Zach Binzer have the studies and the stats that could help you release that stress. I'm Patrice Sikora. Zach, let's start with you because why are we talking about this? Hi, Patrice. Thanks for having me back. We're talking about this for a few reasons. And the biggest one is that a plan tends to be objective and qualitative and humans tend to be emotional, irrational, and illogical, especially under times of great stress. So our goal as advisors with our clients is to help create the plan that fits their current situation and helps them achieve the goals they strive to achieve, but also allows them to commit to the plan and stick to the plan through highly emotional times. That could be high markets, that could be market declines, that could be changes in personal circumstances, changes in family situation. All of these aspects of life can have an impact on our stress levels and can impact how we commit to and execute our financial plan. The most steps that we can take to eliminate the stress, the better adherence we have to our personal plan and the more likely we are to achieve success. A plan's only as good as the paper it's printed on if we don't actually follow it, right? It's like those New Year's resolutions that we don't actually do come February. (laughs) Rachel, what are some of the things we fall into? What are the traps? We're human and humans are fallible. And we know this and we've studied it. There are names for it. There's there's whole fields of study about behavioral finance traps. And we can actually put a name to our irrational behavior. I'll start with this fun one. It's very official. FOMO, fear of missing out, which also could be called herd behavior. So I think this one was very apparent going back to early 2021 and Mm -hmm. a little bit in 2020. Yeah, I think we talked about that speculation and investing and there was the GameStop trade and we're just like, investing is not a game. Stop it. No more. Just jumping on the bandwagon because you're afraid that you've missed a hot tip or something that's going to make you a lot of money. And Zach and I have seen that. Hey, should I be investing in this? That question typically says, okay, that particular stock has been overbought. When you say, Zach. Yeah, it's the example of you're at a cocktail party or a company party or out to lunch with a coworker. And they say, I got a hot tip from a buddy, or have you heard about this stock? I've doubled my money in the past year. No one's heard about it. I even experienced this myself just this past weekend flying home from Austin. The man in front of me was talking to his seatmate about this new stock he's been following. My ears perked up and just (laughs) out of nuance, I wanted to hear what his tip was. And naturally, we all want to participate in success that other people are having, and especially when it feels like we're missing out on, it just elevates that level of emotional response. And at that point, you're buying into something that has already run up. And is the price good? Maybe, but in a lot of cases, not so much. So I'd put meme investing, IPOs, they're not all bad, but a lot of them don't tend to work out. There's just a a lot of examples here. But another thing that we tend to do as people is... um, called confirmation bias. And it's a tendency to seek out, interpret, and conveniently remember information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs. And it tends to ignore or discount information that is to the contrary. You can see this in just about every facet of the news today. Social media will try to perpetuate that because it shows you stuff that you're already looking at, so it's going to keep feeding you that same information. It's because of this thing called confirmation bias. In order to be objective, we have to look at that and say, is this just fulfilling this narrative that I've already created in my mind? Or should I also look at information that is contrary to this opinion that I've already formed? And do people actually do that 
if you are a serious investor, I think you would want to look, but you're right. People watch the news channels they want to watch because it's reinforcing what they believe. I think it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do for yourself, especially in the investing world. So we're looking at a portfolio and a stock they don't all work out at the same time. You buy the stock, you have this information on it, but maybe something has changed in the numbers. Maybe the company is going in a different direction. We have to look at this in a very objective manner to not say, oh, we're right, we're just early. We need to really look at this and say, has anything changed from a quantitative perspective that should challenge my belief? It's really difficult to do, I'd say. I love that, oh, we're right, we're just early. (laughs) <laughs> We're just early. <laughs> exactly. So timing is difficult in itself, and we don't really try to do market timing. We'll get into that later. But speaking of timing, the other one that Zach and I see a lot is recency bias. And that's just a tendency to say what has happened recently will continue to happen. We've had that in 2019, 2020, when things start looking bad we think it's going to continue being bad. Well, then you're really wrong. June of 2020, right after the COVID situation and the stock market's up as much as it is, which is just absolutely crazy. But you look at that and say, okay, just because it recently happens doesn't mean it's going to perpetuate going forward. It's why when we look at a financial plan, and Zach can speak to this, if markets have been bad recently, that generally means that better returns are in the future or in the cards going forward. So it's where you're looking at it in a point in time. And if markets have been really strong, well, then our forward projections might be a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a good example, I think of that, especially through the pandemic would be like Peloton stock. If you bought that in early 2020 and rode that through the recovery from COVID, you would have saw that stock run from the thirties up to almost $200 a share And you thought, well, I've made all this money. I got to continue to hold it. And then recovery happens. Maybe the shiny new toy of Peloton wears off. People buy the bikes, get on it for a few months, realize they're not using it. The New Year's resolutions that Rachel referenced earlier. And now the stock's trading below $10 a share again. So you had an investment that grew up to $200 a share and now is just a fraction of what it once was. But you couldn't sell it because it had done so well so quickly and it, you and know, how it can never anything... fail. How could it right. ever go wrong? And now <laughs> here we are. Wrong? We lost everything. That's just a good example. I think there's so many of these, but going on another one here, anchoring bias, it, that's just to go through a little bit of a list here. You have this ability, this know-how that this number is a reference point on which I base all my opinions. I, I see this from time to time. If a client says, okay, I must get 3% income on my account. And I'm just saying, or an investor, they say, I want 3% income. Why do you want 3% income? I don't know. I just feel like I should have 3% income. And and that may or may not be be true for them, but you're anchoring onto an arbitrary number, not based on larger or broader facts. I should be able to distribute 4% of my account forever. Well, in times when interest rates have improved, yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. Perhaps in a zero interest rate environment, that's not so much the case. We have to look at the facts and not be anchored onto one outcome. Yeah, a lot of financial planning and investment management is evolving with the times. And so if you create a preconceived notion five years ago for those market conditions, and then you anchor to that and try to let that be the keystone of all your future decision making, you may be losing out on opportunities because we all know markets change, economies change. We have to be able to evolve as that time goes by. I think the biggest, though, bias, Patrice, that we see influencing investor behavior is loss aversion. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Well, nobody wants to lose. Nobody wants to lose. But that being said, stock markets do not go up in every time period. We know that. We know that generally in about one out of every four quarters is a negative one. Mm -hmm. It, It doesn't always happen that way. Three quarters good, one quarter bad. That's just not how this thing works. But losses are particularly painful. And there is scientific evidence that suggests that an investor typically tends to focus on losses much more than they appreciate an equal 
gain. A 7% loss feels a heck of a lot worse than a 7% gain feels good, if that makes sense. We look at this when we build portfolios or build a financial plan, how much volatility can, and by volatility, things going up or down, Um, We love volatility on the upside, but how much volatility can we actually stomach? And if we can't stomach that level of volatility on the downside, are we going to stick to our financial plan that we've put in place? You know, we saw that last year in 2022, as markets came down, we had quite a few calls come in saying, I want to move to cash. I can't take it anymore. And that's a sign for us, A, to help educate our clients further on how we've constructed their portfolio, but also potentially that we have their risk tolerance misidentified and an adjustment to asset allocation is required. The the reaction to losses is often more painful than the celebration for wins. I'll agree with that. Boy, will I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So we try to be as objective as we can, but we're all humans and we all want to have only wins across the board. But that being said, it's healthy to put it in perspective and have, call it an outside counsel to that end. Just like we really care about losses, sometimes we can really care about specific pots of money more than others. And we call that mental accounting, (laughs) right? Mental accounting. It's definitely not Excel-based. It's how we feel about specific pots of money. That can influence behavior as well. If you have an investor who's sitting here and saying, okay, I really value the cash in my checking account. It's really important that I have a specific number, maybe that you're going back to this anchored to, I must have this much cash in my checking account. What about in your Roth account? You're in a Roth IRA. You want that to grow over time. Sometimes markets go down. We don't like that, but it happens. That's great. Typically a better time to invest in a Roth than than other times. But, oh, let's take an inordinate amount of risk in a Roth or a 401k or an IRA. Why wouldn't I just buy all small US company stocks and nothing else because that's future me problems. That's future, future uh-huh. Zach, future Rachel. You know, I'll be 70 years old before I need to think about this. Or maybe I am 70 and I only care about one specific account more than another. And I think we see that a lot, probably. And we do that ourselves, which is why it's always healthy to have an outside opinion, I'd say. Yeah, I've seen extreme cases where a client might have four different checking accounts with four different balances, all with four different intended uses. And in reality, a dollar coming out of any of those checking accounts spends like a dollar coming out of any other account. And we see this a lot too with inherited assets. Somehow suddenly those dollars have a sentimental, emotional attachment to it. And it can go either way. Some clients typically want to be way more conservative with inherited assets, for whatever reason, it's almost if I go conservative, I can't lose it and I don't lose my inheritance and and it attaches to, I I don't have to fully grieve the loss of my loved one because I still have the money they left me. That's an extreme example of how different accounts can have so many different emotional responses to it. And sometimes that can blur our ability to execute a plan in an objective way. But the more that the client tells us about that, the more that we know about that, the more we can act to either come to a a rational decision from it or actively say, okay, this particular piece of the portfolio, it, we need to conserve those dollars for a specific reason that is based in logic and therefore may want to manage that more conservatively. So it does influence decisions, but only to the extent that one, it influences a better outcome or two, better adherence to the financial plan, which that's all what it comes down to is translating the results from our behavior, which we've discussed is fallible in innumerable ways how can we become more logical to get better results? I was recently in a training that kind of highlighted the difference between a decision and a commitment. That nuance between those two words impacts what we're talking about today. A lot of people can come in to a meeting or a group or a discussion and say, oh yeah, I agree with that decision, knowing full well or subconsciously in their gut that they're not committed to that outcome and therefore through their own subconscious actions are never going to support 
that decision. What we really need to hone in on is what are people really going to get committed to? And if we can get that commitment, then we can get that adherence to the plan that we're looking for. And what do you say to someone when they turn around and they don't follow through on that commitment? I I think sometimes as advisors, we're making recommendations and telling people what we think we would do or what we think they should do. And the person sitting there, the client says, well, I'm paying these people to give me advice, so I should agree with what they're saying. And, and, and sometimes it's on us to recognize that they're going along with us, but <laughs> maybe body language or some other indication suggests they're not fully committed. And, and sometimes that just has to be the proof in the pudding where we, we make that decision and time goes by and we don't see the behavior change that was discussed and revisit with them at our next interaction and just make sure that we heard them or that they had the opportunity to actually share their thoughts and feelings openly and honestly. And then from there, if we can get to that honest reconciliation, we can adjust the plan going forward from there. And maybe we're not even recognizing it at the time. Yeah, this sounds all well and good, but in actuality, my life works very different than I thought it did on paper. And that's why financial planning is the the gerund for in the ING form. It's ongoing. It was planned, but now it's actually continuing to go on. And that's why these situations are evolving and changing. So we got to be cognizant of that. What have studies shown with all this information we have on behavioral traps? Uh, the studies are probably the reason we have names for all this stuff, because <laughs> economists look at this and say, wait a second, the numbers say this should be the result, but that's not what is actually happening when you look at the average retail investor. There's all sorts of studies on this topic. One comes out of a well-known study called the Dalbar study, and it basically shows, and depends on the time frame, of course, but it shows that just because you're invested in index funds, if you just were to buy the market and whatever the market is, is the return you get, it shows that as investors, we don't actually achieve those results. Wait a second, I'm buying the same thing and yet my returns are different. How does that happen? It comes down to the investor behavior. Investor behavior is driving, as some studies say, as much as 85% of investment performance. If you are not being objective or looking at this in a quantitative and somewhat qualitative way and making these rational decisions, as we know we are not as humans, then your results actually end up being very far from your targets. And it's our job to look at this and say, how can we have a process in place that will allow us to get from here to the goal? We have to follow the plan. We know what we're going to do in good times and bad. We have an investment policy, all those things to put in place. But the average person doing it on their own and not really coming up with a plan, their results tend to be very different. And that's well based in scientific evidence. And we see this too from not only Dalbar, but Schwab put out a study about market timing. And it's this thought that if only we picked the exact right time to put money to work, to invest it from cash and buying stocks or buying bonds or whatever, if only we could time it just right, then things would work out very well for us. But what the study actually shows is that putting money to work, period, taking action is better than trying to do it just right. Schwab put this study out there and it basically says, if you put money to work, invest it right away, that's the best thing to do. Yeah. My mentor had a phrase, time in the market is better than timing the market. Getting your dollars invested and sticking with that is better than trying to be right and guess the future twice. You know, the first guess is to put your money in. Your second guess is to take your money out. And then if you're going to cycle that, you have to keep predicting the future correctly of when to get in, when to get out, when to get in, when to get out. And we have data that suggests that it's better just to ride the ups and the downs of the market volatility. And you'll have a better outcome if you just ride the roller coaster versus try to only buy in the valleys and get out at the peaks. Because if you miss only by a day, as you said, Rachel, you could miss a lot. You can. Even just one single day can really mean a big up or down, which is why when you look at, oh, did I do well this month or that month? 
does it really matter on paper? Did you sell your shares? Did you take a different action? If you stayed invested, you're not going to sell it today. What you care about is the price that you're going to get in the future when you do sell that investment. If we put some finer point to that, if you invested in the S&P 500, just S&P 500 large U.S. companies from 2002 to 2021. So you get this information from a Schwab study. What that says is if you just stayed invested, you would have had an annualized return over that time frame in that particular asset class. We're pretty granular here. Nine and a half percent per year. If you excluded 10 best days over that whole time period from 2002 to 2021, you would have had a 5.3% return. That's a big difference. It's a huge difference. Yeah. Let's say you extrapolate that and you miss the best 20 days. Then you're down to 0.7% return. So you basically Ooh. Ooh. made nothing. You just missed the best days and you're just wrong a little bit, barely at all. And if you go down to 30 days, it's 0.4. And then if you miss the best 40 days over that entire time frame, you would be down 1.5% per year. Interesting. Yeah. The data doesn't lie. So we try to figure out ways to say, hey, we're not going to get this just right. What's the best approach? The best approach in general over many years is to put the money in right away. The next approach is dollar cost average. Just like you are saving in a 401k, you're putting money in each paycheck. You're spreading it out over the course of the year. That's the next best method. And that method is nothing to it. There's nothing strategic. Mm -hmm. There's nothing special about the 15th of the month. It, it just is a discipline process. So how can we drive discipline process into our everyday behaviors? And I think a lot of that comes from having a good plan. And for that, is that the only solution you've got there? Talk to me about solutions. Oh, man. If you think about all these emotions about investing that we've barely scratched the surface on this and you have a plan and you've said, okay, I want to make good decisions. How can I make those good decisions? Because there are certain times when the investing experience is very stressful. The stock market could be down 35, almost 40% at times. How can I really tell myself in my head when I know and translate right. that into my gut that this too shall pass. We will come out this on the other side. And how can I make good discipline investing experience for myself when I have all these feelings? One of the best ways to do that is have someone outside of yourself as a sounding board who has a vested interest and who's on your side of the table. In this case, working with an advisor. I myself... I work on the portfolio side of things, but I also hired a financial planner to help me at Foster Motley, of course, but to help me put that plan into place that in my head, I know what to do. But sometimes you just need someone you can call and to say, right. hey, what do you think about this? Right. We're really looking for that objectivity. And again, trying to get in your own brain and have a dialogue with yourself. Your emotions are going to come to the outcome you want and desire, not necessarily the one that's correct or the one that you need to hear. It's tough to tell ourselves no. Having that third party objectively laying out, here's what you stated as your goals. Here's the plan we put in place to achieve those goals. Here's the turbulence we're running into. Here's a couple options we can consider to address that turbulence and allowing you to make an informative, objective, qualitative decision versus sitting there in your own thoughts, in your own brain, in the comfort of your own home, wishing for the outcome to be positive that you desire. I think the decision-making process is a lot better when you have that kind of third-party input. And I love the part of a financial plan that's the Monte Carlo analysis which is this stress test. If we know all of these things about your plan, the ins and outs about your money, and we know that markets are not linear, some years are very good, some years are very bad, and some years are just mediocre, how can we run thousands of scenarios to check, is your plan going to work no matter what the outcome of this future world, this future market returns. You know, I think that's a very good part of the financial planning process that can help give us some comfort that says, whatever comes, we believe that this outcome will be a good outcome, that we will have good results. And yeah, just to contextualize that for those who may not be familiar with Monte Carlo analysis, but this is uniquely 
built out for each and every client we work with. And it requires us to have a, a firm understanding of all of their assets and liabilities. So a good, accurate net worth or, or balance sheet. And then we also want to have a current annual cash flow that it's as accurate as possible. And then from there, we extrapolate forward, make educated estimates, guesses, if you will, prognostications on what their spending needs might be each and every year now through the the rest of their lives. And for us here at Foster Motley, we plan to age 95 to give a little bit of conservative nature. And then we tell the software, here's our expected market returns, and we tend to be conservative there. And then here's our expected volatility. And basically that software then lives your life for you a thousand different times. And every one of those 1000 scenarios, if you pass away with at least one dollar in a financial account, that's a successful scenario. And then it gives you a, a percentage. So if we see 95% success ratio, that means 950 out of a thousand scenarios, our clients are passing away in our model with at least a dollar left to their name. <laughs> and so that gives us a high degree of confidence that they have a strong financial plan. And this isn't an exam where the goal is to achieve 100% and be fail safe. Some clients do desire that outcome, but we tend to have a lot of comfort if our clients' results are 85% plus in today's current market environment. That tends to give people that kind of objective perspective as we try to predict the future. And much like Weatherman, we're only as good as the data we have and we're still going to be wrong from time to time, but it still gives us a way to objectively review the progress of a plan year in and year out. The plan also is predicated on a given investment risk profile. That's part of the inputs. It's the asset allocation. It's the mix of things. How much risk are we taking in the plan? And that helps us know how high the highs have historically been and how low the lows, how low they can go. That has to be done in a very thoughtful approach with a, an eye on, okay, what are the liquidity needs? Do you need cash from the portfolio? It also has to do with how long the money needs to be invested. Are you 20 years old or are you 80 years old? Your portfolio should look very different. And I know we've definitely done podcasts on that. But the third piece is the risk tolerance. And what better time to have an appreciation for risk tolerance than a bad market? Say, hey, am I going to be okay with letting this ride, right. keeping invested? Or is my inclination to say, oh no, I need to call my advisor and sell some stock. This is too painful. That is an indication that maybe we're running too aggressive on the asset allocation, or maybe we need to put some numbers around this to help give people more comfort. And I think beyond the asset allocation is just this coaching. How can we be on the same side as someone at the table? How can we be on the same side of our clients? It's talking about these subjects such as market timing. Oh, look, I've got all this cash. When would be the good time? As if we have this perfect crystal ball, which we don't. What we know is that over time, markets do appreciate. Broad diversification is good. And we have these philosophies and we stick to them in good times and in bad. And that can be quantitatively proven to be a successful addition to a financial plan. In fact, Vanguard has been studying this for years. It's something that we look about on coaching, financial coaching. They've been looking at this stuff for 20 years. How does an advisor add value to their clients? And they actually quantitated, or they actually said it was about 3% a year, which wow. is just wild. It comes back to that Dalbar study. I was saying, okay, you're not actually getting the results that you think you're going to get. A lot of it com comes from if you're working with an advisor and you're sticking to the plan, the sources of this, call it advisors alpha, as they've named it, comes from that behavioral coaching, how to be tax efficient with your dollars. Are there things that you could be doing that you're not knowledgeable on, or you haven't even considered that apply to your situation? keeping investment costs low as you can and rebalancing the account. And that just means sell high, buy low and follow your plan as long as you're doing those things as best as you can in a very disciplined approach, you tend to have better results. Go figure. Oh, I'll tell you, there's been so much here on financial traps and the solutions. And it all comes down to common sense, which as we all know, we human beings don't have a lot of most of the time especially when money is involved. But how can listeners reach you if they've got some questions on maybe how they should 
better approach their finances? Yeah, you can find us at www.fosterandmotley.com. We've got a lot of information on our website, case studies, fee schedules. You can see our faces and read our bios (laughs) and get to know your team before you call. But that's a great starting point for us. All right, Zach, Rachel, thank you so much. Wonderful episode. And listeners, please like, follow, or subscribe this podcast, and of course, share with others. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to Foster and Motley, a podcast about wealth and life. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information discussed and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Foster and Motley. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Keep in mind that rules and regulations are subject to change. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions regarding your financial planning and investments. Foster & Motley is not affiliated with any third-party providers. Any mention of a third-party provider does not imply an endorsement of that provider. If you decide to utilize a third-party provider, you do so at your own risk.